Shalom and welcome to yet another teaching of the book of Revelation. Today we will move into a totally different realm, chapter 4, verses 1 to 4, which has to do with the throne room in heaven. As we are about to move into the spirit of the unseen realm called heaven, let us do so by turning our spirits to this poem that I wrote. It's called, On Eagle's Wings I Fly. Break these chains, O Lord. Give me wings that I may fly. Make me so to span the distances of the world both near and far. Make my wings beat over vast and troubled regions of an unbelieving world. Might I be made a witness of your story, one that must be told. It is my humble wish to carry forth this message, one of love and freedom of the very soul. Speed me on my way, O Lord, my desire to sow up on high, sing to you my praises above the heavens like a painting in the sky. Make me then fly my utterances, your wonderful melodies that I may proclaim, one that heals the brokenhearted, through grace you ignite the dying flame. Great are your mercies, O Lord, to them that suffer, like unto a balm that soothes the very soul. O mighty one of God, the eagle of the Lord, whose wings I am attached to, soaring with great might, to a place in the heavens, the kingdom in the sky. I was just moved to write this poem and I really pray, brothers and sisters, that um, you are blessed by it. Well, let's get into more of the study. Before we dive into this next phase of the study, I wish to do some outlining in order to assist you, the listener, about some key facts that need to be learnt before we proceed any further. Firstly, the first reason that many do not teach beyond chapter 3 of this book of Revelation is because I believe they lack the in-depth knowledge of the Tanakh or the Old Testament to understand many of the facts and compare them to the Brit Hadasha or the New Testament. As there are many more accounts of the throne room of heaven in the Tanakh than in the Brit Hadasha. Number two, chapter four onwards takes the reader into the future, well beyond the current church age, which is why John must have had an outer body experience 2000 years ago to experience all these future events. Number three, because the book was written in Greek, we must not only understand the key phrases and symbolism he used, but also understand what John was witnessing and presented in his mindset of the times that he lived in and not one of the 21st century believer. Number four, which is very, very key in this study. There are two Greek words that I will mention and will guide us as the chapters unfold, uh, where are in time continuum or speaking of the end of an eon, which is a Greek word, for a period of time. Let me just repeat that. There are two Greek words that I will guide you in the chapters as they flow. In time continuum, or the word mentioned is speaking of an end of an eon, a period of time, where a new time frame is coming into existence or not. In chapter 4 to 22, the two words are kai, K-A-I, and metatauta. In the English translation, kai would be a time continuum, and metatauta would mean after this, the end of one period of time and the beginning of a new one. Therefore, in retrospect, chapter 1 was John's spiritual outer body experience of a meeting of the Lord in the holy place in heaven. Chapters 2 to 3 were the Lord's instructions that were given to the seven churches or assemblies 
that were present at the time that John lived, but would extend right up to our present times of the 21st century, which would conclude the church age at the rapture, or what in theology we would call the dispensation of grace. Point number six. Chapter four opens up with the Greek word metatauta, which means, as I said, after this. This means that the church age had concluded and a new period or a dispensation had taken place. That would be chapters 4 and 5, which focuses on this amazing experience called the throne room of God. Chapter 6, 2 opens up with metatauta, which means a period on earth that had just opened up, which is going to be the worst period in all creation called the tribulation, which would be broken up into two periods of three and a half years each and right up to from chapter 6 to chapter 22, which is the end of the book, without any breaks in time. As from chapter 7 to 22, the opening Greek word is chi and not metatauta. And, which means the period just keeps getting extended just like an orchestra plays from one end to the other. So, my sincere advice to you, my brothers and sisters, is to avoid any distractions when doing these lessons as it's key to understand the contents of each chapter and the scope of what we will be presented with as we will be confronted with much symbolism and understanding each chapter would be key in preparation for what would follow next. So here begins the study. We will read chapter 4 verses 1 to 4 and this is part 1 of chapter 4. The second study which has not begun as yet will continue uh, a few days onwards. Chapter 4 verse 1. Metatauta. After this I looked and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a shofar said, Come up here. And in the Greek it would sound like this, Anabanio hode, Anabanio hode, Come up here. In English we would, we would read it in the book of Revelation as, Come up here. But in the Greek, it would be Anabanio Hode. And I will show you what must take place after this. Now, who is saying this? The Lord is speaking to John and he's telling him, Anabanio Hode, come up here because I'm going to show you what is going to take place hereafter. Having reviewed the things that have been Revelation chapter 1, and the things that are Revelation chapters 2 to 3, we have now arrived at part 3 of the book, the things that will be after this metatauta. John looked up and saw a door open, the one that he had first heard about when he wrote down the letter to the Church of Philadelphia. If we were careful enough to remember the promise made by the Lord in chapters 2 to 3, only the Philadelphia church had a promise of a door opened to them by the Lord. This is the reason I qualified my apologia about Philadelphia, that this assembly was destined for the rapture and no one else. If this should not spur you into two actions, I doubt any other will. The first action is to guard your crown because that's what the Lord tells those in Philadelphia that you've worked so hard so long to gain lest no man take it away so in short ensure that you do not possess it at any time have, let me just repeat that lest no man take it ensure that you do not lose possession of it at the time of the rapture because that's what the demonic forces will attempt to do the second factor is to be a witness to other of the three assemblies or individuals whom you really believe are in Thyatira, Sardis and Laodicea, lest 
their blood be, be upon your soul as highlighted in Ezekiel 33 1 to 6 it's called the call of the watchman so we will end part one here and part two will follow shortly welcome to part two of Revelation chapter 4 verses 1 to 4 Paul's first epistle was to the church in Thessalonica and written to the Thessalonians in AD 52 in revealing to them exclusively the mystery or the mysterion of the hapazo or the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4.16. The call from the Lord would be anabanyo hode or come up here. Remember the Lord standing above the turbulent waves of the Galilee and he calls out to Peter with one word, Ekomai, come, Matthew 6, Matthew 14, verses 28. And the word of God says in Revelation chapter 4, verse 2 to 3, At once I was in the spirit, or the Ruah, and there before me was a throne in heaven, with someone seated on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper, and carnelian a rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne in the twinkling of an eye john was catapulted forward in time to the day we all dream of the hapazo the rapture of the church since he was traveling through time he must have had an outer body experience because he wouldn't be given one until the rapture of the church so he called it being in the spirit the same thing had happened to the apostle paul about 40 years earlier when he was also taken to the throne room of god in second corinthians 12 verses 1 to 4 however paul was not allowed to tell us about it but it's just a memory that provided him to sustain himself and motivate him to withstand the severest forms of persecution and suffering. Unlike Paul, John was told to record everything he saw. The jasper and the carnelian he saw were the first and the last stones of that were placed on the high priest's breastplate and may summarize all of them as that of a rainbow in a symbolism of God's mercy. Now the moment John saw the Lord, he saw what we would call in Hebrew Kohen Hagedol. Kohen Hagedol means the high priest. And remember, he was writing to Jews. So the moment he said, I saw someone, and what I saw was the jasper and the carnelian, he's talking about the first stone, as well as the twelfth stone. Because what the high priest would wear, what we would call commonly call the breastplate, in Hebrew had twelve stones and is called the Urim and the Tumim. Urim and Tumim means lights and sounds. So therefore, the high priest wore it in the temple in Jerusalem and this could be John's interpretation of his meeting the Kohen of Kohens the Kohen Hagedol of heaven in the temple and he uses the rainbow as a metaphor for the breastplate of the high priest which had 12 colors or 12 colored stones. Surrounding the throne were 24 elders on other thrones. Now surrounding the throne of God were 24 elders on other thrones and seated on them were 24 elders. Now this is something that we are going to really have to study because there's much debate in theology about this. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold and the Greek word for that is Stephanos, uh, what we would call crowns. In Greek it's called Stephanos on their heads. That's Revelation chapter 4 and verse 4. These 24 elders confuse some people but they shouldn't. Their appearance gives them away. They have thrones, so they are rulers. They surround the throne of God, so they are assisting him. They are seated, a sign of royalty. 
They are dressed in white, so they are righteous and washed by the blood. They are wearing Stephanos, which is the Greek word for crowns, which are really victors' crowns or overcomers' crowns. And only the church was told to be overcomers. They are called elders, a title long associated with Christianity. So far, we have had plenty, a, a pretty strong case for them representing the church, but there's more. Some try to explain the 24 thrones by saying that they belong to a group of ruling angels or malak. But four prophets saw the throne room of God and recorded their experience in the three in the Tanakh, one in the Brita Dasha. The first was Isaiah, Isaiah 6, Ezekiel chapter 1 and 10, and Daniel 7, and finally John in the Brita Dasha. In their descriptions, neither Isaiah nor Ezekiel made any mention of the 24 elders, indicating that they weren't present in the Old Testament times. Daniel's vision uh, concerned the end of times. In Daniel 7, 9, he mentioned multiple thrones, but didn't add any details to the number or the type of occupants. This is consistent with the fact that the church was hidden, a mysterion, to the Old Testament prophets, even in their visions of the future, and only confirmed to Paul in Romans 16.25. Only John makes mention of the 24 elders. And note that these elders were wearing Stephanos, crowns of overcomers. The church won't receive crowns until the Bema seat that takes place only after the rapture. I will conclude part two here and part three will follow shortly.